Um, welcome to the second installment of Piecing the Puzzle Together. Um, we have a number of really good talks, um, kind of dealing with a wide range of topics that are critical to the um, evolution of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, both past and present. Um, before we get started, I'm um, just going to give a quick introduction to myself and my, and my fellow conveners. Um, I'm Dougal Hansen from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm a postdoc there. I'm Roger Creel. I'm a PhD student at Columbia University. And I'm Marion McKenzie. I'm a postdoc at the Colorado School of Mines. And this is also a reminder to be giving evaluations for student presentations as our first presenter is a student. All right, um, so to start things off, we have um, Ben Lindsay from LSU, and he's gonna be talking about a mid-Holocene unpinning of the Ross ice shelf from Ross Bank. One down and two to go. Ben, thank you. All right, hey everybody, I'm Ben Lindsay. Like they said, I'm a master's student at Louisiana State University. And before I get started, I just wanted to thank my co-author and advisor, Phil Bart. I also wanted to thank Val Stanley for all her help at the repository, and then also Juan Chow, a diatime biostratigrapher, and NSF for the funding of the project. Ice rises. Ice rises exist where an ice shelf becomes pinned on a submarine bank. So in this figure from Matsuaka et al., we have the Kupal Kialkov Skogo ice rise, and the I clicked the wrong thing. I thought it was going to be a pointer. Um, but so we've got the ice shelf pinned on top of the submarine bank, which is the brown shaded region at the bottom. And it's pinned from about 100 meters below sea level to about 350 meters below sea level. And where the ice shelf is pinned on top of this submarine bank, it creates an ice rise, the dome feature. And for this exact example, the dome is raised about 250 meters above the regional grade of the ice shelf in the region. So the ice rise that we just showed was at the Fimble ice shelf at the top, marked by the figure 1B near the drowning Modlan. And so these ice rises are spread out all across the continent. They're outlined in the blue. And I want to direct your attention down to the Ross ice shelf and the Ross Sea. So the current calving front of Ross ice shelf is pinned by Roosevelt Island and Ross Island. And about 100 kilometers north of that calving front, where it's marked figure 1C is a shallow submarine bank, Ross Bank. And I'm going to show you a cross section. So in the center of this cross section is Ross Bank. To the west, we have Pinnell Basin. And to the east, we have Glomar Challenger Basin. This is based off a single channel seismic line. And based on where these sites where they penetrated strata, it was correlated that we're hitting middle Miocene and lower Miocene strata. And it's outcropping on the eastern flank of Ross Bank. It's also underlying the crest of Ross Bank. But we don't yet know what is the youngest strata on top of Ross Bank. Also in this figure, it's showing what the ice rise would have possibly looked like. And where these red arrows are, it's marking the radial flow, because as the ice shelf gets pinned on these banks, it reorganizes the flow and creates a radial flow. So the objectives for the project are how, when, and why did the Ross ice shelf unpin from Ross Bank? and what were the consequences of unpinning. Methodology, we started by selecting some cores that were located on the bank, some legacy cores, went to OSU and, and made some observations on these cores and then sampled based on the units that we were seeing. And we performed grain size analysis at LSU and then we sent radiocarbon samples off to NOSAMS. Here's just a map of Ross Sea with Ross Bank in the middle, the Ross Ice Shelf calving front, a little south of Ross Bank. And so all of the gray shaded area is 500 meters or less in water depth. And then the pink shade is 300 meters and less water depth. So I'm going to show you Ross Bank. And this figure is showing it with some legacy multi-beam data overlaying. And then we have this one core location, KC2. And then these are all of our crustal cores. So I'm highlighting KC2, I'm going to show you that first. It shows us the classic strata type that we'll see in these deep basin deglacial sedimentation areas. And then I'm going to show you the crustal cores. And so I'm going to show you that KC2 and then go into the crust cores and just show you what we're seeing on the crest and how different it is from what we're normally used to seeing with the strata types in the deep basins. So I'm going to show you those three on the crust. And then lastly, I'm going to show you PC77. 
Here's KC2. Based on the visual core descriptions and then the granulometry and diatom data, we believe that the bottom of the core, we had a subglacial unit. Going up core, we had sub-ice shelf, and then it's capped by an open marine unit. And so this is just the classic continental shelf deglacial stratotype that we're used to seeing in these deep water settings. And so then this is, I'm going to show you a north to south cross section, and it's going to be highlighting these three cores and what we're seeing and how different it is from what we see in these deep basins. So starting from the north side with PC90, we get really sandy sediment, lots of mud and lots of fossiliferous content all throughout the core. Then moving to the central core, PC82, we have a really sandy top, and then we just have a very homogeneous silt and clay unit going downwards, and it also continues on the north side with PC69. So for 82, we have that top area with the muddy sand with pebbles, fossil content is present, and then it goes down in this homogeneous unit. And what we believe is that this top unit is residual glacial marine, so once the ice shelf left the area, currents were able to come in and winnow the really fine sediment away and just leave us with really coarse sediment left. And we believe that the really homogeneous unit that we got into is possibly Pliocene in age, and that's based on some diatom data that we have. So here's this diatom figure. On the left axis, we have the depth, and then on the bottom, we have the percentage of the diatoms. And so based on what our diatom biostratigrapher mentioned was that only the topmost unit is modern assemblage of diatoms, and then everything going down is older, possibly Pliocene in age. And I'm just showing you at the bottom a box core sample where we had some diatom assemblage just showing the modern assemblage that was currently gotten from this box core that was on the crest of Ross Bank. So the top would just be that winnowed residual glacial marine sand, and then this Pliocene sandy silt with some scattered pebbles. So then moving down to the north side of the crest, we have PC69, and we have something very similar there, just very sandy residual glacial marine sedimentation, and then we have just this homogeneous sandy silt unit. And we as well believe the same thing based on the diatom data, that only the topmost unit is the modern, and then going downwards that it's possibly Pliocene in age. So then going to that south core, where I'd mentioned that it was all very sandy, we believe that this is just completely residual glacial marine. It was started off at a sandy silt and then moved upwards into a silty sand. And we did have two radiocarbon dates from this core. We had one at 113 years at about 280 centimeters and then 475 at about 55 centimeters. So clearly there's some type of reworking or remobilization that moved this carbonate down core and mixed it up. And so this is just an example. This is one of the barnacle plates that we found in one of the legacy cores, and we sent it off to no SAMs. Now I'm just going to show you an east-west cross section and emphasize that last core that I had mentioned, 77. It's right on the flank of the bank. So here we go. And so I had already showed you um, the first two cores, 82 and JPC02 where we've got that residual glacial marine, and then PC77 is on the flank of the bank, and we see this really sandy unit, very mixed up, and we characterize that as being like a localized debris flow in the area, possibly being shed off from the top of the bank. And then I just put KC2 here to just show you, once again, we've got that bottom unit is subglacial, moving upwards in the sub-ice shelf, and then open marine sedimentation. And so just kind of giving you, I guess, perspective that in KCO2, we had 60 centimeters of this deglacial sediment, and then we have really small amounts of this open marine deglacial sedimentation, and then we have the debris flow. So here's the data for 77, where we've just got sandy, it finds upwards, and then sandy again finds upwards, and then sandy again. We do have a radiocarbon date right here, uh, just right below 5,700 years ago. Here's that barnacle plate that we sent off to NOSAMS. These are all the barnacle ages that we got, but I'm just highlighting the oldest date we have because we know with the location that I showed you all that it had to have, if it's not in its spot, it had to have been shed from a higher location, showing that Ross Bank had to have been ice-free by that point. So the ice rise is no longer there, the ice shelf is gone. And so here's just a conceptual model 
showing LGM and Ross Bank. And so the yellow line and the red line are correlated to this part on the right right here, right here, and just showing you the sedimentation in the area. So at the LGM, we have no sedimentation going on. It's a hiatus in the sedimentation. And then as it starts to go into the deglacial, we get the sub-ice shelf in Glomar Challenger Basin. We get a grounding zone wedge, and we get subglacial deposition. Still just erosion on Ross Bank. Then we get the ice shelf on both sides of Ross. We have and then on Ross Bank. And then as it opens up more, we get the full Ross ice shelf over Ross Bank, where the winnowing can come in, which is this little red arrow above the crest, and then possible debris flows. And then lastly, some iceberg turbates that can mix up some of the sediment and the carbonate. And so the open marine and the deep water basins is basically coeval to the residual glacial marine. So our conclusion is that based on these preliminary results, the Ross ice shelf had to have unpinned from Ross Bank by approximately 5.7 thousand years ago. And it's not yet known wh uh, why it did unpin in the mid-Holocene. Oh. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks, Ben, for the fantastic talk. Um, next up, we have Slavik Tulacek. Um, who's going to be talking about unlocking the subglacial time machine, constraints on the climate sensitivity of ice sheet behavior from subglacial precipitates. <laughs> All right. Well, you gave me an oral presentation, and I spent months with you in the field. You should have known better. <laughs> okay, unlocking the subglacial time machine. Uh, this is going to be a very different presentation um, because I want to mostly convey my excitement about the fact that nowadays we have things that have precipitated beneath the ice sheet in some water somewhere and can be dated, and sometimes, you know, one piece of subglacial precipitate represents 100,000 years of, of uh, accumulation. An amazing record, to me, that's kind of like a breakthrough, comparable in some ways to ice cores, uh, because our field is so poor in data that, you know, I've been think thinking about the subglacial world for 31 years, and, and just these precipitates basically have exponentially, by orders of magnitude, increased our knowledge in terms of data, because it's easy to model, quote unquote, easy. Um, but in terms of data, this has increased our knowledge tremendously. And um, really, I'm just the, like an a unwanted cranky uncle who show, shows up at the Thanksgiving dinner un, uh, uninvited. Um, I'm a self. Uh, appointed um, PR person for Terry Blackburn's group. So Terry is a, a professor, associate professor at UCSC. He was the one who got this brilliant idea uh, to, you know, scour different repositories, more, mostly the repository in Ohio State, to find the precipitates and then to apply his and his students' amazing knowledge of geochemistry and isotopes to understand what these precipitates tell us. So I'm just here to tell you how excited I am about that as somebody who's been thinking about subglacial world. You've seen Sophia's great presentation and then Jessica's gonna go tomorrow and Gavin and Terry have posters as well. Of course, thanks to NSF and USAP for making a collection of these samples possible over time. And here's just pictures. Terry was here, but he, he had to leave. Uh, and then you know the faces, Sophia is there, Jessica and Gavin. Uh, in the upper right corner is uh, uh, Matthew Hines, who's helping uh, Gavin with uh, the carbon work. So Gavin's gonna, is working on an exciting manuscript uh, about the subglacial carbon budget and what carbon is doing beneath ice. And Mattis is a, is a specialist in 
carbon in the Southern Ocean. Uh, so he's helping with that. Another co-author, uh, Graham Edwards, is right there. He's now a postdoc at Dartmouth, and uh, he's uh, done some work on precipitates, but in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and uh, Gavin just got his PhD like a couple months ago, and is now at Brown. Oh yeah, some of you might think about, it, you know, why is this guy here and not talking about Twaits because I'm part of Twaits. So, so this is my excuse slide. <laughs> yeah, I told you it's a different presentation, and you know, never give me a presentation again. Um, <laughs> so uh, our 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 team is one of the two teams that are have been heavily affected by. Uh, by the pandemic, and, and Marianne Karplas and TJ Young are leading a, a team, and I just want everybody to cross fingers and wish best luck that this season will actually be a full science season. All right, back. Uh, since I didn't know how much time I will burn on my first three slides, um, here's a take-home slide. Uh, so let's run through that, and then we'll, I'll show you as much of the evidence as I get to. Uh, subglacial precipitates, as I said, are a lot like ice cores, but they tell us about the ice sheet itself. The ice cores are really kind of like an atmospheric sediment that represents the global climate. And uh, uh, the precipitates can be dated ur uranium series, uh, which is a problem, yeah? Like all these wonderful people going to the marine environment, really they can collect cores, but uh, creating a timeline is very difficult because well, there's a lot of dead, red, red, dead carbon in around Antarctica, so you can't really rely on C14 easily. So uh, we have now an archive that tells you about what happened beneath the ice sheet in terms of uh, paleoclimate and paleo environments there. Um, and point one, which relates really to what uh, Sophia was showing, is that the chemistry and isot isotopes in these uh, in these precipitates change with with climate, yeah, and you can take a ice core record and the wiggles in chemistry in these precipitates, which form beneath ice, align with wiggles in the ice core records. Amazing. And, and we also see point number two, that even more amazingly, somehow, these precipitates that formed in nooks and crannies beneath the ice sheet know about what's happening to climate in the northern hemisphere, especially to the uh, thermal hairline overturning oscilla uh, oscillation. So uh, the aims that were mentioned in Sophia's presentation, you know, they are related to what's happening in the northern hemisphere, and we can see them in the subglacial precipitates with basically very little discernible lag, which, you know, suggests a few things. Um, one is that you have um, probably a transmission of the signal through the basal water system itself. It's not through glaciological processes alone. Uh, you know, the, the thing about the, uh, in the past, ice sheet was ignored, Antarctic ice sheet was ignored because everybody thought that it's just this, you know, pile of ice that sits there passively. That's based on John Nye's um, estimates of the glacial dynamic, um, uh, um, you know, adaptation to climate, uh, which are thousands of years, typically. So everybody thought, oh, ice sheets are, are, are irrelevant because they're too, too slow to react to climate. Uh, but, you know, now we have record from beneath the ice sheet that within decades to centuries um, something happens in the North Atlantic and we see it in the subglacial world. Um, so the other point that's kind of important that we think that the way that aims actually impact what happens beneath ice is through, uh, again, thermal hairline oscillation somehow changing conditions such that more uh, water, warm water gets to the, to the grounding lines uh, uh, of Antarctic glaciers and the glaciers retreat and that is the kind of mechanisms that makes the communication between the North Atlantic and the subglacial environment. Um, the longer term perspective is that, you know, for now, Terry's group has been relying on just samples that are available because somebody picked them up um, and we already have samples that as I said, one of them is 100,000 years of precipitation, and there are like dozens of samples. Some of them are as young as 30,000 years, others are as old as 6 million years. So over time, we might be able to piece together a really a more or less continuous record of Antarctic ice sheet response to climate over millions of years. Well, 
for way cheaper than it will be to get a one million year ice core. <laughs> Which is worth it, totally worth it. <laughs> I don't want to get any hate or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> totally worth it, yes. I mean, it's, it's the only record of atmosphere that we really have, so it is worth it. Really, I believe that. Um, okay, so so I, this, is, this is a slide that reminds me to kind of remind you that it's easy to kind of become jaded and caught up in every day, but when I started working with Terry and, and his work on precipitates, I had this, you know, moment like the uh, Jesus rays are coming across the clouds and it's amazing it's, it's it, it this is a quote from uh, Star Trek Captain Catherine Janeway we are doing extraordinary things or these guys are doing I'm just <laughs> there to tell them what they mean <laughs> uh, but yeah it, it's extraordinary like <laughs> how crazy it is that you can find a piece of rock that took hundred thousand years to form 2,000 times longer than a human lifetime. And you can see you know, climate oscillations from Northern Hemisphere in that rock. What we do is extraordinary. It's, it's amazing that we get to do that. So remember that. When you do your thing, whatever you do is also extraordinary. Yeah, it's a com combination of so many things have to go right in order to for us to be able to do either the field work or the modeling or the lab analysis. And to remind myself how wonderful it is, from time to time I like to uh, remind myself about this William Blake lines from a poem. To see a world in a grain of sand and hold infinity in the palm of your hand. And that's how I feel when I hold these precipitates. Okay, so how do they get to the surface? They form at the bed, of course, beneath some deep ice where it's wet. And after they precipitate it, something changes and they get eroded. I don't know where to look to know when I'm supposed to stop, so out <laughs> you're out of luck. <laughs> uh, so they're eroded, incorporated in the basal ice, and then shafted against the transantarctic mountains in this case and come up in moraines like that. Sorry, I didn't ask where I'm supposed to. I'm good? Okay, I'm talking really fast, excellent. Um, I can switch to Polish because I can even talk faster then. <laughs> <laughs> so, some examples of, uh, you know, uh, why do we think that these subglacial samples actually reflect basically global processes? Well, because you, you have situations like this, and this is, you know, this is, these, are, these are one of these wonderful moments that we had. You know, uh, a student brings a record, uh, like the record of calcite, relative calcite uh, concentration in the sample, which is basically layers of calcite and um, and opal, and uh, and you line that up with ice core record, and you see that Wiggles agree. Why? Why should they? They shouldn't, but they do, and that's wonderful. And then you know, people like Jessica and and Sophia and and Gavin can go to different fancy instrumentation pieces of instrumentation make measurements and can tell you about things like oh these uh, whether you get opal or calcite depends on whether you have a lot of melt or very little melt so on even more information from uh, you know chemistry that you can actually infer ph oxidation state uh, organic matter what kind of organic matter you have in the precipitates and chemical weathering time scales all kinds of wealth of information that we've never had before, at least in that detail. Uh, Terry also uh, reached out to a very good uh, ancient DNA person at UCSC, Beth Shapiro, who had a, a postdoc who was interested in glacial things, uh, Sarah Crump, and, uh, and she did some pre preliminary analysis of ancient DNA. And so possibly we might one day have a record of how microbial assemblages have changed through time and space in Antarctica. Almost done. Not really, but <laughs> not really, but almost. <laughs> okay. I'm done now.
Thanks for the uh, fun and lively and inspirational talk. Uh, next up, we're switching gears to the grounding zone, and Kasha Warburton is going to be telling us about the formula formation of tidally modula modulated landforms at rapidly, rapidly retreating grounding lines. Thank you. Sorry for the tongue twister. Uh, and also sorry that there will be less poetry in this presentation. <laughs> Uh, so this, I'm now a postdoc at Dartmouth, but this is work that was mostly done during the end of my PhD. With know where the grounding line is migrating across the region, we then want a model of how these ridges are forming. Okay, so the first thing you might think is, okay, they look kind of like wedges, maybe they're grounding zone wedges. We know that sediment is being transported to the grounding line and deposited there, either because that's where the ice loses contact with the bed, so if you have a deforming layer of sediment, that's where it's being dropped off, or because it's melting out from some englacial debris. Um, so what happens if we just take this point source and we move it back and forwards with some average retreat? What kind of bed forms do we get? Uh, yeah, it's playing. <laughs> um, and one thing you see is that it does make little ridges. 
And that's because when the, eye, when the grounding line makes its high tide point, it kind of pauses there and then starts going down and then it's at its low tide point and then it starts going up. And so you get this kind of pattern of ridges which maybe has some tidal features. Unfortunately, when we analyze the pattern of the data, <laughs> what you see on the right is very much not a nice, clean, fortnightly signal. Uh, it's just a mess because you're getting one thing at high tide, one thing at low tide. They overlap. This doesn't work at all. Just to show you. But <laughs> so we need to add an extra ingredient. And that extra ingredient is going to be an amount of push. So uh, what happens if that sediment that you're depositing is still quite mobile and then the ice re-advances almost like a rolling pin and squeezes it into a kind of push moraine? Then you'd only get one little ridge per tide. It would be at the low tide position and it would be then left there, left well alone as the uh, ice retreated further from that point. And now this is, I will say, this is a very, very sort of simple idealized model. It's making little ridges that are perfect triangles because <laughs> we haven't included any collapse of the sort of seaward facing front. Uh, it's, we're just assuming that the ice is coming off in its shape. This is a very idealized model, but hopefully points in directions to see like where if we put in better till rheology, ice sediment interactions, we could get them looking more nice, but just like as a proof of concept, this does, uh, and here I'm extracting on the right, the features of the topmost, so the largest slope profile. Um, they have a really nice, very well correlated 14 ridge cycle to them. This is a really convincing way to produce, reproduce the kind of observations. We haven't put in anything crazy, but we, what we have done is we've had to go to quite a high value of theta effective, which means quite a high rate of ice melting or thinning in order to drive them. This bottom plot, the bottom one, which is in blue here, that's more of an ice plane scenario. And the reason it doesn't work is because, um, hopefully I've highlighted it. Yeah, the reason it doesn't work is because uh, when the low tide position moves so much per tide, it's actually not moved very much per day of retreat rate. So the uh, low tide positions kind of overlap each self and it hasn't retreated enough to not re-squish the ridge that was previously there. So you kind of get these giant things forming that disrupt the tidal cycle. So it's plausible that these ridges at Thwaites were formed on a daily cycle, but they could have only done so following some rapid thinning. So some kind of uh, perhaps an unpinning and a dynamic thinning rather than melt, but it was thinning fast at the time these were forming. Okay, um, I don't know how much time I have. I have two minutes, okay, perfect. So uh, I just wanted to talk again about the uh, Larsen Inlet ridges because we have this caveat that there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between low tides and ridges, particularly if you're in a sort of ice plane scenario. And uh, the ridges that we have in the Larsen Inlet, we don't have a long enough sequence of them to see that sort of frequency analysis, so we can't directly correlate them with the tides in the same way. Um, and here's a representation of the tides in this area, and there are two tides per day. And as I said, these things are 25 meters apart, approximately. So uh, at the time that this data was published, they suggested that that meant, okay, well, we've got two tides per day. These things are 25 meters apart. That probably means that this place was retreating at 50 meters per day, which is kind of huge. But um, when we tested our model with that as our retreat rate, we actually saw that that suggested that the ridges should be further apart, like 50 to 60 meters apart, because uh, the tides, one was stronger than the other, and so it was getting these composite ridges. So actually, these things could have been formed with a more modest retreat rate of only, only 25 meters per day in this region, which is, of course, still huge, but like it's half what they proposed. Um, and perhaps there's some stuff we could do about the frequency of these sort of double peaked forms, which are twice as close as the other ones, and see how that kind of corresponds to bits of the tidal cycle where you only see one tide per day, which is kind of interesting future work that could be done. But um, since my red flag has appeared, I'll just leave you with my conclusions. 
um, and point you towards our paper, which came out in the prior sphere earlier this year. Thanks. Thanks, Kasha. All right, for our, our next talk, um, Benjamin Hills is going to be telling us about radar-derived crystal orientation fabric suggests devised stability at Hercules Dome during the last ice sheet uh, deglaciation. Yeah, thank you. All right, getting late in the afternoon. I'm sure everyone's excited to talk about fabric and radar polarimetry. <laughs> Uh, here, let's see if I can test this thing. Yeah, so I should, I'm at Mines now, but I should uh, thank my collaborators at UW. This, all this work was done at UW, um, and this kind of builds on some of the other work that we've seen uh, earlier in this, in this meeting. So I want to start by just contextualizing Herc Dome for folks who aren't super familiar with the area. Uh, and kind of referencing back to some of the previous studies that have been done here. So uh, starting with the ITAS Traverse, uh, we're lucky enough to have Bob Jacobo in the room. This was 20-ish uh, years ago that they drove through this area and did the kind of the first survey at Herc Dome that has uh, kind of uh, grounded a lot of the work that we've done since then. Uh, then we saw um, uh, a few years ago, uh, they flew Polar Gap and Kate Winter kind of made some broad interpretations that Andrew briefly mentioned in his talk. Uh, where there's these, these big troughs that she found that kind of bound uh, Herc Dome. Third, uh, Andrew presented yesterday and showed us some of these beautiful uh, swath mapped images. Uh, a lot of that uh, was ground based work that we did in 2019 and 2020, and he identified this subglacial valley feature that is on the kind of uh, towards East Antarctica side. So, East Antarctica would be to the right here. Uh, we call it East Dome there. Uh, then I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Shivangani and some of the folks from Coldex uh, who flew this line. That's uh, this kind of light gray here. Uh, and she talked about some of those data. But my focus today is going to be uh, on this western side towards West Antarctica uh, at this, w what we're calling the summit, uh, or it is the summit of Hercules Dome. And we kind of focused our uh, survey from this most recent season at that location. We did some HF surveying as well as some, as some, uh, uh, some PRES data that I'm going to talk about today. So why do we care about the Hercules Dome Summit? Uh, well, Hercules Dome is the divide between um, the Ross and Ronnie ice shelves. So it's a place where we can kind of think about dynamics between the two. And here I'm just showing a, a simulation uh, deglaci through de deglaciation that shows that uh, the dynamics between the, the, the deglaciation of the two ice shelves could have been had different timing, and that could affect dynamics at the divide at Hercules Dome. Uh, so when we're thinking about divide dynamics, uh, some people have shown and maybe not talked about directly, but uh, these coastal ice rises where we often see Raymond arches, and uh, we see those in the stratigraphy. They were hypothesized by Charlie uh, a few years ago now, but they have then been observed a lot at a lot of these coastal ice rises, and we can say something about st stability in the divide dynamics based on that stratigraphy. Uh, but further inland in the interior divides, places like Hercules Dome, we often don't observe these and that might not be surprising because the ice is a lot thicker. It would take uh, a lot of uh, uh, consistency in the both the accumulation and the ice flow. So at Waste Divide, Hercules Dome, we don't see such an obvious uh, Raymond arch. So I'm going to use a couple different methods instead of uh, just looking at the strat stratigraphy to try to investigate the ice dynamics uh, around this area at the Hercules Dome Summit. The first is interferometry, just to measure how fast the ice is flowing. We should be able to pull out a divide signal in, in the vertical velocities. This is a method that Johnny talked about yesterday as well as a, a few other people. So the idea is that you repeat uh, a phase sensitive radar uh, measurement at one time, and then, or you make an acquisition, then you repeat it some later time after the ice is strained. And uh, based on a phase delay, you can uh, pull out how fast the ice is, is moving. So we did this at Hercules Dome Summit. Uh, and this is what we found. These are this, this, this is this series of vertical velocity profiles here going across the divide. So here, ice would be flowing into the Ross sector here and towards the Ronnie to the, to the right. Uh, and what you see is this Raymond effect uh, where you have uh, more curvature, a more nonlinear vertical velocity profile kind of closer to the to the divide and then more linear away from the divide. And TJ talked about this a bit in his paper, but now after this most recent season, we have the full transect across the divide and uh, it's kind of consistent with what we published in, in TJ's paper. The second measurement, which I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about, is of the crystal fabric. So for folks who don't spend a lot of time thinking about 
Uh, individual ice crystals, I just wanted to brief you really quick. So ice should be deposited isotropically at the surface, meaning that snowflakes fall randomly on, on the ice sheet surface. But then as the ice deforms, those crystals rotate based on, on how the ice is forming. And at a divide, you have this uh, kind of, oh, shoot. That is not what I wanted. Uh, you have this uh, compression in the vertical, and then you have some outward extension, and that should form what's called a vertical girdle. It looks like this. And that actually is measurable by radar. So very similar to the, the previous measurement where we waited some time. We made an acquisition at time one, let it strain, and then uh, made a second acquisition. Now we're going to instead do both acquisitions during the same season at the same time, but actually strategically polarize the antennas. Horizontally spread one and since the crystal tropic, the radar wave travels at a different speed uh, depending on the polarization. So if, uh, if there is some crystal orientation fabric, uh, then you should be able to pick that out based on, again, phase delays within the, the two uh, radar acquisitions. So we come up with images that look like this. Uh, I won't spend too much time uh, interpreting these because they can be a little bit confusing, but the idea is that we can pull out two kind of bulk signals within the, within the fabric. Uh, one is the, um, the, the bulk orientation, so if there's a, a girdle, then we can uh, map out the orientation of that. And we've done this across Hercules Dome. I'm only going to focus on uh, this one transect again at the, at the summit. We have these all over Hercules Dome. And then the second is the strength of the girdle, and that's, depend or that's uh, associated with the, uh, with the phase gradient. So as, we, uh, as Merlin mentioned when he was talking about his instrument alpaca yesterday, uh, he talked about this extinction axis. And that's going to be the same thing that comes out here. So you can uh, get extinction in a cro uh, two cross-polarized acquisitions. And that's what I picked out in this uh, pink line here in each of these images. And that's going to be uh, coincident with where you can interpret the phase gradient and say something about the, the strength of the, of the girdle. So we did this at the same sites as that, uh, that previous image where I was showing the velocities. And now I'm showing in the top panel uh, the uh, the depth phase, uh, and this is the comparison of phase between the H polarized acquisition and the V. So the, the gradient here, the depth gradient in phase, should correspond to the strength of the vertical girdle. So I plot the, um, each of the acquisitions here, the, the comparisons uh, at th the top, and then I pull out uh, what I am seeing as the girdle strength here, and you can see uh, kind of this bump that co corresponds to the, the present day ice divide. Now, uh, we get some signal in the, in the ice fabric. We want to say something about how long that might have taken to develop. So I, uh, I took a model from Nicholas Rathman and uh, ran some forward simulations from, uh, these are just really, really simple. So just started from isotropic and then just squished consistently in, this, in the same strain regime uh, until you get to some steady state. And then I pulled out this number here uh, for um, one over E to steady state. So that's what I say is the kind of the spin up time or the stabilization time. And I ran that across uh, the, the full parameter space. So some of this is poorly constrained. And I think it's a uh, room for us to think about doing more uh, laboratory experiments for squishing ice and uh, under different temperatures and different stresses and uh, trying to, to figure out how ice deforms uh, or uh, recrystallizes in this way. Uh, but yeah, so there is some room on the parameter space and recrystallization. So I ran the same experiment over kind of what I think is, uh, is reasonable. And I uh, got to these stabilization times for, uh, for throughout this uh, parameter space. And Hercules Dome is a cold divide. So uh, compared to say like a shear margin would be really warm and you might have uh, much faster recrystallization. But uh, at Hercules Dome, this time that I'm pulling out is on the order of 9,000 years. So uh, kind of capturing the, the most recent deglaciation uh, that I was talking about at the beginning between the, the Ross and the Rani. So in summary here, uh, we're seeing this uh, crystal fabric effect uh, being preserved at the Hercules Dome summit. And that's kind of uh, o extended over the time of deglaciation here. And uh, it makes us think about kind of the, the difference between the east part of Hercules Dome that Andrew was talking about with this over deepened valley, he talked about the sediment rich and it's likely thawed uh, at the bottom there, as opposed to uh, what we're now kind of interpreting at the, the Hercules Dome summit 
Uh, it's up on top of this elevated block, so the, the bedrock is a lot higher. Uh, there's probably a lot less sediment, and it, it's likely frozen there. So um, we're seeing, or I'm arguing that uh, the 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 fabric signal that we're um, preserve or that we're demonstrating kind of indicates that uh, this area is less likely, or um, demonstrating some kind of resistance to the flow changes during the deglaciation through the Holocene. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Um, our final presenter was unable to attend in person, um, but fortunate she was uh, able to send a video. So um, Christine Sidaway um, will be giving a talk on glacial sequences and surficial features that appear in Antarctic GeoMap, a continent-wide detailed geologic map data set of Antarctica. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the organizers of WASTE uh, for the chance to introduce a new geologic data set to the WASTE community. GeoMap is a digital geological database that depicts known map geology of rock exposures and now for the first time ice margin deposits, uh, unconsolidated materials, and seasonal superglacial water occurrences at continent scale. The resolution is one to 250,000 or better for some parts of the Antarctic continent. The online data set is attribute rich, queryable with 42 populated fields, uses GeoSciML and is offered in the Creative Commons following FAIR data principles. The renderings in this image, I'll follow in sequence from left to right. Contemporary satellite imagery and digital globe data from um, Polar Geospatial Center was the basis for uh, spatial geolocation. Um, various uh, strategies can be used by users to uh, show an appropriate degree of detail for their applications and uses for geological data. Beginning with, in the second panel, a very simple lithostratigraphic classification that simply um, depicts rock type, um, including six types of bedrock lithologies, seasonal water and ice, and any unconsolidated sediment. As an alternative and a little more complexity over on the right, a simple geology classification that uh, depicts a bit more of geological succession can be used where at a high level of detail, um, a representation that taps into time, space, and stratigraphy uh, taps into 186 classes of age and rock type that tried to detail chronolithostratigraphic legends. This effort involved a large number of collaborators from at least 14 national programs. Um, I've attempted to list everyone um, and acknowledge all those contributions here including from an engine room of students and interns who translated legacy data in its variety of types into the geospatial standardized database. Um, what were our starting materials? We had over 100 years worth of non-standardized geological maps, figures from literature publications, and um, hundreds of these documents, close to 600 maps of varying scales and types, and nearly a thousand names and codes to translate into uh, the standardized um, GIS database format. Most docs were raster images with low spatial reliability and literal or no representation of glacial geology and cover sequences. What's displayed here, you might perceive as a conventional geologic bedrock map with polygons now spatially accurate that in the digital data set can be clicked to display um, menus of items with the characterization of 42 attributes. 
for regions of interest at um, regional and continent scale. The spatial reliability of GeoMap um, means it's um, a new important form of ground truth that can provide a basis for contemporary multispectral mapping and classification of high resolution imagery, for example, to create geochemical composition maps that have meter or better um, resolution. As an alternative way of um, map depiction, those interested in su surficial geology, cover deposits and water could filter out the bedrock geology detail and just emphasize the younger deposits that here for this example of the dry valleys uh, range in age from 1 million to 1,000 years. The legend on this map lists just a portion of the 70 different types of surficial unit classification in GeoMap that range from um, local glacial hills, evaporite deposits, fan gravels or beach deposits, along with named drifts in areas that have provided rich histories of Pliocene and Miocene um, glacial sedimentological evolution. West Antarctica was even more poorly mapped. Um, this image from Coastal Marie Birdland illustrates glacial rockfall and seasonal superglacial water um, sites that are now part of the continent-wide inventory. West Antarctica had exactly zero representations of surficial deposits in previous regional map representations in the Dry Valleys area that I showed before in 1990s maps had two classifications by way of comparison. The beginning of GeoMap coincided with ComNAP's 2014 horizon scan, which prioritized 80 research questions and a roadmap for Antarctic and Southern Ocean science. Most of the questions were interdisciplinary, Therefore, GeoMap worked to provide geological information that meaningfully intersects with cryosphere, hydrosphere research, and biosphere research. An interplay of the geological factors that um, support those intersections are listed here. Um, such factors as substrate age and chemistry, albedo, grain size, roughness, porosity, permeability, water content, and so forth have um, factored into the preparation of the GIS that um, will be a new resource for cross-disciplinary science. At a local or regional scale, as an example, GeoMap can be used to pinpoint sites of seasonal solar warming of rock exposures that lend to uh, meltwater formation, a process that's generally not accounted for in surficial water modeling. Uh, from a preliminary, very simple study, sites of seasonal meltwater in the GeoMap database correlate spatially with areas of low albedo from satellite image. Uh, measurements. At a continent scale, GeoMap contains nearly 4,000 water features of a seasonal nature. Um, drawing upon polygons from the Antarctic Digital Database of past decades, but with hundreds of additions that were hand digitized from recent satellite imagery. This task we prioritized because of the impact of surface meltwater upon ice sheet um, evolution. Hopefully this time consuming methods that we used for the surficial waters will be replaced soon by automated machine learning. Lastly, um, just an illustration that rock and water combined to form habitats in the biosphere realm. GeoMap is going into use by colleges to investigate microbes, lichen, mosses, and microclimates for introduction of future Antarctic biota targeting sites where moisture and nutrients are available from rock, sediment, and soils. With over 500 maps incorporated, I just want to acknowledge again the degree to which students and interns um, contributed to compiling the legacy data into the contemporary GeoMap 
So a second round of thanks to the student collective that had support from many national programs and mentors. Um, the lead geospatial expert that directed this engine room team is Belinda smith Lytle from GNS Science. And with that, another shout out also to the leadership and resources provided by um, GNS Science colleagues. My final slide shows how to access GeoMap. Thanks again to the WACE organizers, sponsors, and all of you for a great meeting. I'm sorry not to be with you there in person. Have enjoyed the rest of the conference. All right, that concludes the uh, presentation part of this session. And uh, Hello. Yeah, thanks everybody, great talks. Um, yeah, as uh, Ben and Slavic uh, mentioned, uh, repositories are um, really valuable, eh? Um, so just connecting that with Christine's talk, uh, I think there is an incredible opportunity waiting for some geologists out there uh, to merge the global repositories of Antarctic rocks with this amazing new uh, map of GeoMap, which is uh, not correlated with, with rocks. So obviously the, the map data that went into the formation of that amazing piece of work, uh, there's a lot more work to do. So I think uh, just to put the challenge on the table, uh, thanks. Uh, before my question, I'll just uh, say I totally agree with that last comment, and uh, I hope someone does that. Um, my question is for the first speaker, Benjamin Lindsay. Um, thanks for sharing that. It was fun to see all that uh, old data being reused as you've done. As you said, your radiocarbon dates are a bit jumbled up, but I think you said 5.7 Ka for your retreat from that bank. Um, is it possible that that was a temporary retreat and that ice regrounded there after that point and that is one of the reasons those dates are so jumbled? Thanks. Um, I guess from what we saw, I guess in the sedimentology, we didn't see much of any signal for like a regrounding going on um, and then um, yeah, I would, I guess, say no. I, I, at least I don't believe from the data that we had that there was a regrounding that occurred. Question for, for Ben. Um, so wh wh where, where, where is the, the core going to be drilled? Yeah, uh, so I didn't talk much about the ice core, but ultimately there will be an ice core drill that Hercules Dome has TJ uh, kind of laid out the timeline for us. I think we've known since uh, we first started doing surveying there that uh, East Dome area where Andrew has identified all these really over deep in valleys is a terrible spot to drill an ice core. Uh, so surely not there. We're thinking that uh, Summit is much better and that's why we kind of refined our survey this most recent season, did a lot more PRES measurements densify the grid and kind of uh, focus the airborne survey on that summit area. It'll probably be just off based on kind of uh, the bed topography that we're seeing there. It'll probably be just off the summit there um, towards the Ronnie side a little bit. Yeah. I have a question I could ask. 
This is for um, Kasia with the, the push moraines. Do you feel like that terminology for that landform like fully represents what it is, or do you think it those landforms deserve like a new title altogether because of the the title response that you're seeing? Yeah, um, we we went round around in circles a bit of what to call them. I think in the paper we settled on uh, ribbed ridges or something like that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess there was this idea that they would be formed in this like pushed moraine-like way. And in the paper, we also explore the idea that they might be formed more like dunes, but this kind of seemed more implausible given their size. So, yeah. One, one follow-up. Um, I noticed one of your slides uh, pointed to, had some text on the top pointing to the volume of, of sediment in these ridges as pot potentially containing information. Um, have you thought about maybe ridges, these ridges being a window into grounding line flux or some other um, measurable quantity? Yeah, absolutely, because if you sort of calculate their size and they're six meters wide, 20 centimeters tall, that means in that day there had to be uh, a meter squared per amount of width uh, of sediment. So that's kind of, I guess, if you think if the stream is flowing at a meter per day, then you, that means like a meter of sediment is being dragged along under these streams, which seems like on the high side, but not like orders of magnitude out of the way. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely an interesting question, but like, you know, it's nice that it's plausible that they were formed on the daily cycle. It's giving us pretty high value, but uh, yeah, it's maybe possible. Follow up on Julia's readvanced question. I think there are readvanced questions for two of the other speakers as well. Where Ben, you're seeing stability to 9,000 years ago when we know there was pretty significant retreat and readvance. So big dynamic changes, and Herc Dome is just sitting there unresponsive according to your model. Uh, and then the idea of these being titled push moraines that means it's you know unidirectional retreat mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, what's going on? I'll, I'll just leave it open for you to, to discuss, I guess. Uh, yeah, good question. And uh, I don't know that I feel confident saying that Herkdome broadly would be uh, unresponsive, but this summit is kind of, like I was saying, pulled up uh, out of the surrounding troughs uh, up on this, um, what's called the, Kate called the Teal Mountain Block. So I think that uh, actually some of Andrew's work has shown that these uh, over deep in troughs uh, with the sediment and that are probably thawed uh, could be maybe more uh, responsive to kind of downstream changes uh, closer to the grounding zone, but that uh, Herc Dome Summit is kind of pulled up out of that is what I'm, I'm thinking, yeah. I, I guess quick follow-up to that, does that make us need to rethink when we're going out and doing these tests for collapse, right? We, we've done this a couple times now, going to specific spots because we think that's a good place where we will see you know, a 5E collapse. Do we need to rethink that model with a little more subtlety? Um, possibly, I, yeah. I, I don't know if Andrew wants to add to this. Uh, I, he's done some great modeling. Uh, I, I don't know that I have the best answer to that. I mean, I guess they're really signatures of a period of sustained retreat rather than re-advance. Like, you'd expect that during a time of re-advance, these features might get wiped out totally, depending on how solidified they were at the point. Um, but I guess the fact that it was retreating this rapidly um, over f a fairly short window of time uh, it needs to be put kind of in a broader context of retreat over a longer period. So we're seeing a signature of fast retreat, but that doesn't mean that like over the course of that year, the average retreat rate was necessarily he I mean, large, but not as large as this like short window tells us. So it would be really nice, and I don't know what stage of this proposal exists, but that to, to sort of try and identify these as existing between grounding zone wedges sort of over a longer uh, space to see whether we can identify like the 
the frequency at which these fast retreat events happened themselves. So I have a question for Uncle Slavic. So uh, I'm, 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 I guess we, we know generally where these precipitates lived. And, and so I'm kind of wondering, is there, is there a mother load somewhere where there, there's a, a really nice, long, continuous record in one place? Yes, uh, yeah. it's, it's in these locations that we propose to NSF to visit. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so you, so you, you are going to spend a lot of money. <laughs> okay, thanks. I mean, Ma Mount Akernar is probably like the most promising for really, I mean, long, there's so much debris there. Um, you know, for now, the Elephant Moraine and Reckling have been probably the most productive in terms of um, different precipitates, different kinds, different ages. Um, so, but it, it's just going to take some time um, to poke around and, and find enough of them to uh, kind of string along a, a long record. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic approach. It's really neat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So my question is for Ben Hills. And it's amazing to see some Raymond, Arch Raymond Arches and um, just something that Richard Heimarsh used to say. It's one of the first things where, or one of the few things where a theoretical glaciologist has predicted something and completely independently observations and then come along, and somebody come, has come along later and found loads of observations of it. So I wanted to say that. But then the question is about, um, you didn't find Raymond Arches in that dome. And the idea of, I understand, is that the susceptible to moving around enough that you don't form those Raymond arches there. And the time scale of formation of those things is like the characteristic time of the ice, thick of the ice. Yet you do see f crystal fabric. So how does the time scale of the, the fabric orientation, crystal orientation fabric compare to the characteristic time? And so does that window, does that bracket the, the stability time? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, and one that I expected. Um, I think that uh, there's room for us to do it. So TJ did some stratigraphy modeling in, in his paper um, and uh, found that possibly the accumulation signal has moved around a little bit. And uh, uh, I also think that the bed roughness there can kind of obscure the stratigraphy a bit. I think that there is room for like a full stress model um, to kind of, uh, like you have done in the past, uh, uh, try to map, like, um, invert for the actual stratigraphy that we see and test uh, if there is Raymond Arch because uh, if you, or if there's any kind of sign of one. Because if you look at it, it there's this bed bump kind of right at the divide location, so it's hard to interpret that directly. So yeah, I think that there's room for another study. Um, I also think that the, um, the fabric signal is maybe kind of uh, preserving a, a broader divide stability, whereas if you have kind of subtle changes in the, um, in the accumulation effect, a slight uh, um, shift in the accumulation signal, then that could actually disrupt the stratigraphy enough and maybe it wouldn't uh, actually affect the, the fabric as much. But uh, I think that the fabric signal is showing that there hasn't been uh, a really uh, big shift in the divide position or especially something like a rotation in the divide. So that combination of no bump or maybe a small bump, but some cr some fabric could be quite diagnostic if you did some forward modeling, I guess. Yeah. I think that's really cool. We're having a string of excellent questions from more senior folks. I just want to throw out that if any ECRs also uh, have questions, please uh, feel free to uh, shout out. This is a question for Cassia. It was a great talk. Um, so, could you put your ridges in context with, uh, like, uh, Martin Jacobson's ridges that are all in the same area? Um, it's really interesting that that you're getting such similar tidally driven things. Is there like something special about the Pine Island Bay area that that kind of causes these there? I'm gonna confess ignorance of those other ridges. I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I 
I guess like one of the questions is like why why have these ridges only been seen in these two locations? And I would say that it's perhaps more a uh, consequence of only having had the uh, technology to be able to map these tiny features recently rather than the fact that they're not ubiquitous necessarily. But I have a question for Slavic. Um, we've been talking about retreat and re-advance quite a bit. Um, do you have a sense that there are precipitate records that could give us insight into that fine scale grounding line retreat? You mean the timing of it or the spatial extent? Either one. The timing for sure. I mean, the only way that you know I can see, and maybe I, I'm just limited in my imagination, but uh, the only way I can see this connection, teleconnection between the northern hemisphere climate as and beneath is heating, you make more melt water and so on. Um, so, you know, we're already kind of, that's how we are interpreting these, uh, these teleconnections right now because we, I can't think of any other, other mechanism for that, which is an important contribution because there's still a good number of at least uh, of, uh, ice sheet modelers who are not sure whether ocean thermal forcing is kind of very important process. And certainly, you know, there's a pot potential for increasing spatial coverage for these samples and then seeing whether you see the same sensitivity, say, on the say the, the, the Indian Ocean section of the ice sheet or other parts that are not as maybe proximal to, uh, to Southern Atlantic and, and so on. I think we have time for one more question. If not, maybe we give another round of applause for our speakers.